In this video, you're going to learn about all of the topics that are on this page right now. All of them are about how to set up a bank account, and you might notice that those are the same ones that you can see in your study guide in that section. Section 3. Here's the ID that you need to set up a bank account. The key term here is proof of true identity. Um, those are the items that the bank will require in order uh, to prevent crime and fraud, but really just to know that you are who you say you are. The specific kinds of ID you might need include uh, valid photo IDs like a driver's license or a passport or other proof of identity items like a utility bill or apartment lease with your name on it that connects to that card. And then most banks require your social security number, which is a number that's been assigned to you since birth if you're an American citizen and were born here. Um, and if you are a person not from the United States, there's other ways you can indicate that you are a legal resident capable of opening a bank account. Uh, in general, though, you probably want to avoid places that don't ask for ID because that's uh, pretty shady. Now, once you have proof that you even can get one, it is your turn to start judging the banks. So when you are comparing different account options, here are two key things you want to look for. The interest rate on those accounts and the liquidity. Now, what matters here is what you need this account to do for you. For example, you might notice that you're checking over here has no average interest rate, which doesn't seem like a good thing because that's a way to earn money, but it's so liquid. It's so easy to use your money in a checking account. That might be what you're looking for. So depending on what you are looking for, your account needs will be different. But in general, look at this line. Liquidity, as it goes down, the interest rate goes up. Now, it looks a little out of order right here, and we'll talk more about money market accounts in the section where we cover the specific kinds of bank accounts. But in general, you see that the more interest rate, the lower the liquidity of that account. So for a checking, in general, you see very high liquidity, almost no interest rate. Savings gives you a little bit of interest, and it's still pretty liquid. You probably want to use that for your emergency fund. Certificates of deposit have a pretty high interest rate, but it is difficult to get your money out. So you wouldn't want to put any money in there that you would need anytime soon. Money market accounts are a little easier for banks to go out and invest, and so they'll offer you a higher interest rate, even though their liquidity is still pretty high, close to what you get in a savings account. Sometimes the liquidity on money market might be a little bit lower, but actually between savings and money market, it varies significantly from bank to bank. I'd watch out, because all of the numbers on that slide are really just averages. Uh, all liquidity, fees, uh, the amount of interest you're going to earn varies a lot from account to account. And uh, you want to look at the fine, fine details of how you trigger different fees in particular. Because you've got some tricky banks out there. Here's some things you want to very particularly look for. There's a lot of stuff on this page. But let me highlight some of those underlined words and then we'll talk about banks versus credit unions. Factors to consider. One, the interest rate. That's how quickly the bank is going to pay you money on the money that you have there, if it's an account that offers that. On the other side of that, there's bank fees. It's basically the main way banks earn their money in these sorts of accounts. And that is any situation in where you're not meeting some requirement or you've done something wrong and the bank charges you money. Uh, you want to look at different accounts in terms of what do they offer. Some banks offer free checking, meaning that you're not paying any sorts of monthly maintenance fees. Sometimes banks will offer savings with a very low minimum balance or no minimum balance, which means that you don't have to worry about how much money you have in your savings account. Usually that means it needs to be linked to a checking account or something like that. Uh, you have you want to look at to see whether a bank has online banking options, which are really nice for accessibility, uh, how many ATMs they have, what hours they're open, whether or not you can go to the bank and use a safe deposit box, which is literally just a box in the wall where you can put your stuff inside the bank's vault, which is mostly safe unless you have some sort of Ocean's Eleven type situation. Uh, there's a whether or not banks have drive up windows, which is a convenient thing if you live in a suburb. Uh, if they have weekend or evening hours, you want to look at what sorts of deals they'll offer you on certificates of deposit if you have accounts with them whether you can get good deals on mortgages or personal slash business loans. So if you have a relationship with a bank, are they more likely to offer you good money if you're trying to start a business, which some of them are. But I would say, if you look over here, if you have the, dip, uh, the option between banks and credit unions, in general, look to see all these different fees. You may notice that the fee from a bank is going to be at least a little bit higher than the fee from a credit union. And that's because credit unions are owned by their members. 
and their whole goal as a nonprofit organization is to benefit their members. So not only do they offer lower fees, they sometimes offer higher interest, and they can be easier to work with for loans. But you do have to qualify to join them. So you just want to look at the particular credit unions in your area and see which ones match who you are. Here are some questions to ask, because banks, it's not like they want to hide things from you, but they do make their money off of the fees that you pay. So here are some questions you want to ask. You want to ask about the different kinds of accounts they have. You want to ask about whether they have interest. You want to ask how long it takes from when you try and deposit money to when you can actually get that money. Uh, you want to ask for each specific account, what kind of fees are there on it and how can you avoid those fees? And then you want to look at the physical locations of that bank, if that's important to you. I like to walk into a place and talk to a person because I hate going through phone trees. And sometimes the websites of these companies can be really terrible. So if that's you also, look how many sort of places they have you can go. Let's check out an actual example of how to open a bank account. I really like WikiHow for a lot of how to do different financial things. And this one in particular is good. So in opening an account, it's going to talk about some of the things we've already looked at. Make sure you're eligible. Here are some specific rules. Uh, not all banks require you to be 18, and some just require you to have a parent to sign on with you, but you want to look for their specific rules. Then you choose a bank that's best for you. They compare large banks versus small banks, and I would also put in there whether you want to do a credit union or a retail bank, uh, but that's up to you. And they say pick the kind of account that you want. We just talked about that. Then you want to actually visit your bank. And I do recommend doing this. It's a good experience uh, to go there and talk to those sorts of people, see what that professional environment is like. You might even find a job that you like when you go to a bank. And then it says to ask those important questions. That's step five. Step six, supply them with all that necessary information, which pitfall, you might not show up with the right stuff the first time you go. You might need to go twice, but if you listen to my advice, you'll probably show up with the things that you need. So just go ahead and do that. Then all of the information that you get from that meeting where you go to set up your account, and you've got all, you know, you've deposited the minimum first deposit, you've done all that, then you just want to make sure that you keep all of those documents, every single document that they give you, uh, particularly your personal identification number, your bank account number, um, your the routing number, the checks that they give you, all that information is going to be very important to you. And when you set up your account online for that bank, if they got an online part, which they absolutely should, uh, then you want to make sure that you keep all of that information available as well. All right, let's talk about overdraft protection. This is very important to consider. And I would point you first to the meme, I guess we would call it, over here on the right side. And this is true. I actually found the article that this came from. It's uh, in Bloomberg News. You can go find it for yourself. Banks collected over $30 billion in overdraft fees last year. <laughs> it's another way of saying that banks took $30 billion from people that had no money. An overdraft is when you try and take money out of your account. But you've got insufficient funds, meaning you don't have enough money to cover how much you just tried to take out. So like, say you swipe your debit card. Now you're overdrafting. Uh, you're going to get charged a fee, and it can be big. Sometimes it's $35, $40, $50, somewhere in that range. That fee and the fact that you did the overdraft are going to hurt you because overdrafting also hurts your credit. Now, overdraft protection then might sound like a good thing because that means that instead of overdrafting, which hurts your credit, the bank just takes money out of your savings or the bank will loan you the money to cover it. Um, in general, the best option here is to just have your bank decline any transaction that would take you into overdraft uh, and then have a backup method of payment because you don't want to be in a situation where you need this gas for your car, but your car doesn't have enough money on it. And so now you're stuck where you are uh, and your phone is out of battery. Just everything is going wrong for you. So have a secondary method of paying for things. And that's just a better option. But let's consider the advantages and disadvantages because depending on who you are, it might be a better option for you. Advantages. You avoid bouncing checks, and oh, bouncing checks is a more common thing, hopefully, than uh, overusing your card. And that can hurt your credit rating, and the fees for overdraft protection, when they either loan you money or take money from your savings, is usually lower than what you'd pay for a straight overdraft. So that's good. Disadvantage-wise, you can get stuck in debt, because as they keep giving you money to cover it, and then you stay in the negative, they're charging you fees for being in the negative, and that means that you then have to pay more in fees and suddenly you're in debt to the bank just from having an account and that can be a big problem. And it's generally just cheaper to manage your money well than to have to pay 
for ways of cleaning up your messes. It's just a better deal.